had a 15-minute presentation that I was going to give, and I said, if it's okay with you, I'm going to go ahead and give it. So we have it by 25. I want to talk about federal policy and state policy and policies in general. And if, if I may, I'm going to start with a um, personal anecdote. It was 4 o'clock in the morning at the George Washington University Hospital where I was a senior medical student and I was called to the room of a patient to change her IV. I had been there before. She knew who I was. She had presented at the emergency room about three weeks earlier with a gangrenous foot. She had a long-standing diabetes that was terribly neglected and uh, after her evaluation, the recommendation was to have an amputation. Very common. But she refused the amputation. So the medical team was, was forced to think, what can we do? And what we did is put her in a bed and put up an IV and said, for the next six weeks, you're going to stay here with, on IV antibiotics. We knew we weren't going to win this battle. She was going to have the amputation anyway, but we thought this is all we could do. Well, I thought it was a pretty good, pretty good with a needle. But every time I would go in to change her IV, she would curse me a blue streak and say, you're just making my life here more miserable. Um, and I would mutter under my breath, saying, thinking, why did you just get the amputation over with? This is not going to work. We were wrong. After several weeks, she left the hospital with her foot still attached. And as time went on, I realized we were wrong in another way. And that was, she had long-standing diabetes. And as you heard this morning, diabetes Type 2 diabetes has its foundations in insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is triggered by foods. And if you change what you eat, the insulin resistance can turn around, and it can get better. And diabetes, in some cases, even goes away, or if it doesn't go away, it becomes much more manageable. And our own research team found that when people have long-standing diabetes with complications of neuropathy, and their feet are hurting, and they're having ulcers and so forth, even that person can improve dramatically if they make enough diet and lifestyle changes, but we were ready to amputate her foot. And not one person on the care team that during the entire time she was in the hospital talked to her about food. Now, I think we could be forgiven a bit, because at the time, we didn't know what food could do. Dean hadn't done his work yet at that point. Um, we thought a diet meant that you switched from beef to chicken, or took the skin off your chicken. And that really didn't do very much. And besides, d diseases were bacterial, or they were caused by genes or something like that. And so we really didn't think there was much of it. But, but this revolution has occurred. And I'm going to say 1990, that was the year the Lancet published this wonderful article saying that heart disease could be reversed. And now we know that diabetes is a two-way street. And you know that cancer can be affected. All of these things are so powerful, and, and the answer really is in food. And so you think, well, doctors would be thrilled to have that information. We would scream about that and make sure that all our patients knew about it. But I have to say, when we look at what we feed our patients and what we guide them to eat very often, <laughs> in the hospital, we serve the worst possible foods. This is my hospital, George Washington University Hospital. There's the, the uh, hel helicopter coming in to deliver more bacon. I took this picture on Sunday um, at, at the hospital Sunday morning about 8 o'clock. This is what we're serving. And the World Health Organization said that's not a good idea. Uh, bacon causes colorectal cancer. You know these, these statistics, 18% increased risk for every serving. But it's not just colorectal cancer, it's breast cancer. Now high versus low, about a 9% increase in breast cancer, that's not much, is it? Well, 9% of something rare is small. 9% of breast cancer, increase in breast cancer mortality is, is dramatically higher. It, it, that's a lot of bodies. Let me get political for a minute. This is Washington, D.C. That's, that's the shape of Washington. And if you look there on the, the green ward, that's Ward 3. That's the affluent ward. And the R means that 22, that's the rate of colorectal cancer. 22 per 100,000 people every year are diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Down on the bottom, the tan one, that's Ward 8. Those are economically disadvantaged people. The rate is now 73 per 100,000 people. In other words, if you live in Ward 8, you're, you're likely to be getting colorectal cancer is more than three times higher than Ward 3. That has nothing to do with genes. It has all to do with food and marketing 
and food, uh, food habits that we hand on from generation to generation. And there's a hospital in Ward 8, a public hospital, that is closing down because we don't have any money for that. And so that hospital not only can't, can't provide any nutrition information, it can't even provide medical care. They stopped doing deliveries years and years and years ago. We've got a serious problem. And worst of all, when we think about young people, all these cancers are rising in young people. And by young, I mean anybody 49 or below. Why would colorectal cancer be rising in young people? I'm gonna say it's because bacon is a fad. You can get bacon flavored soap. Kids are immortal, they don't think about these things, and so we're losing the war on cancer with these folks. And the answer is we've got to act. And, and when I say we've got to act, I don't mean just healthier products in stores, we need that. We need public health uh, uh, initiatives all over the place, but when I say we must act, I mean our profession has to act. And by that I mean we need to teach nutrition, we need to learn nutrition, and the AMA has weighed in on this very, very clearly. It's one policy says the AMA encourages effective education and nutrition at undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate levels, and education on physical activity and nutrition should be part of all education. And not only that, but it's also healthy hospital food. In 2017, the AMA said, have plant-based meals for patients, for visitors, for your own staff. Get rid of the processed meats, throw it out, have healthy beverages. The American College of Cardiology followed suit. Have the plant-based meals offered and promote them. No processed meats, have healthy foods in hospitals. We can do this. Now you'd think that the medical profession would say, let's do that. But we're getting pushback from every hospital in this town, including the hospital that's not yet closed in Ward 8. And we're getting pushback from doctors. Uh, Mary Che, uh, the council member for Ward 3, has introduced a bill in the city council saying that doctors must have, have nutrition as part of their CME. Is that a good idea? I'm glad to hear you applaud. I'm glad to hear you applaud because when I talk with my colleagues about it, half of them say, right on, it's about time because my job is really hard because you don't know about nutrition. And we see this every day at the Barnard Medical Center. A patient comes in with diabetes. They've had type 2 diabetes for 15 years. No doctor talked to them seriously about nutrition and followed up and made it easy. By the time we get them, their kidneys are shot. Their eyes are affected. They're having, having neuropathy. Our job is that much more difficult because other doctors don't know about nutrition. And if you prescribe only metformin or only insulin, you affect that patient and nobody else. But when you, when you teach the patient about food, their whole family can profit from that. When we don't deal with this, we're in trouble. And I often think of Semmelweis. You know Ignaz Semmelweis, do you remember from medical education? 1847 in Vienna, he said, I think that we could reduce perinatal mortality in women which was at that time about 10% in some of the hospitals. We could reduce that if we would wash our hands before touching the patient, and he proved it. He instituted strict hand washing, and he dramatically reduced the, the likelihood of perinatal mortality. But doctors said, that's an insult. We have poor hygiene? I don't think so. And when he died at age 47, it was still not accepted that we need to wash our hands before touching the patient. Well, things can change, but they have to change faster. Um, the Henry Ford Hospital and the Joint Commission put out this uh, report, which is so important, because it was about quitting smoking and getting smoking out of hospitals. In 1984, my hospital allowed smoking. Patients could smoke in bed, as long as the oxygen wasn't running. And I, as I was chief resident, walked into the hospital gift shop and I bought Merit Menthols. And my chief of surgery was buying Marlboros and we lit up on the way to the doctor's lounge. We weren't stupid. We knew it caused cancer. But we thought, I'm under stress now. This helps me deal with it. I'll quit later on. And finally, 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 we made the decision that we had to ban smoking in the hospital, and that was the best gift I ever had, because I couldn't smoke at work anymore, and I realized, fine, that was the time. But anyway, the Joint Commission, they said, don't wait, do it now. And that would read food, okay? We've got to change hospital food now. Don't worry. Yes, there's pushback. Do it anyway. Collaborate with other hospitals. So if you're in Kaiser, all the Kaiser hospitals should do it together. Don't phase it in, ban all the bad stuff. And get buy-in at the top. If your CEO doesn't believe it, you've got to work on the CEO. Okay, now there are state legislation. I mentioned that in, in Washington, D.C., hopefully it will be the law that doctors have to learn about nutrition. We have a bill in New York State also. 
hospital food, as you know, in California, it is now law to, that you must, hospitals must have plant based meals. Thank you. In New York, uh, a bill has been passed by the state legislature. It's now on Governor Cuomo's desk, in requiring that plant based meals be offered and promoted in New York hospitals. If you know Governor Cuomo, please give him a call. Um, but if you want to do this in Utah or Idaho or, or South Carolina or whatever, please work with us because we have model language that we have worked out with other stakeholders so that we can agree that we're going to do this together. You don't want to have enemies uh, that you don't have to have, okay? Um, now on federal food policy, really quickly, if we just take a look back in time, it shows you where we're going, hopefully. Back in 1991, the first pyramid came out and we knew it was going to come out. And it was a step in the right direction. It said more grains, more vegetables, more fruits, smaller amounts of meat and dairy. But for us, at the Physicians Committee, we thought, why have meat in there at all? Why have dairy in there at all? So we pulled together a press conference at the Willard Hotel, about three blocks from here. That's Colin Campbell. Um, that's Dennis Burkett, who discovered the value of fiber in the diet. And the doctor on the right is Oliver Alabaster, a cancer researcher at GW. And what we said is, all you really need are grains and vegetables and fruits and legumes. And Mary Ambrose from the New York Times was there and she wrote an article about it and said a group of physicians is asking the Federal Department of Agriculture to abandon the four food groups and st substitute what many will consider a radical new grouping of foods. The new four food groups are fruits and grains and vegetables and legumes. Meat and dairy products are options and minor ones of that. Well, as it happened, the government went ahead and released the pyramid and that was too much. The Cattlemen's Beef Association happened to be meeting in Washington, D.C. And between Mary and Burroughs reporting that doctors don't think you need meat at all, and the federal government seeming to reinforce that with these tiny little meat portions that was smaller than the vegetable portions, they went to the Secretary of Agriculture. And Secretary Madigan said, you're right. The pyramid looks anti-meat, and he stopped it, pulled it back. There was no pyramid as of May 8th, 1991. And everybody knew that this was politics. A year later, they re-released the pyramid, almost unchanged, at a cost of $800,000 of study. Um, and then it proceeded to get crazier and crazier and crazier. And so in 2009, we went to the White House and said, fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes, let's put it on a plate. People eat on a plate. So we submitted this to the US government. We didn't hear back from them. So in 2011, we filed a lawsuit against the government, simply to compel response. And the government did respond with something they call my plate. I'm not taking any credit for it, but it does look remarkably similar in several respects to uh, what we had sent them two years earlier. Fruits, grains, vegetables, two differences. They have a protein group, which to their credit, could include, it may include chicken, meat, and so forth, but it also includes tofu and, and nuts and, and other plant sources of protein. And there is a dairy group, but to their credit, it includes soy milk. So not perfect, but going in the right direction. So where we are now is we are hoping that my plate will be further improved, get rid of the protein group, switch it to beans, get rid of the dairy group, and maybe we could have a new improvement. <laughs> And finally, the dietary guidelines are revised every five years, and in the year 2000, the guidelines were really produced out of sight by a committee that nobody really knew who they were. So we used the Freedom of Information Act to get the CVs of the committee members. Six of the 11 had ties especially to dairy, but also to meat and to eggs. And so we filed suit, said, I'm sorry, there is something called the Federal Advisory Committee Act that says you can't operate that way. And they had several lawyers, and we had one. But it helps a lot if you are right. So the judge ruled in our favor and said this, the guidelines were not properly done. So since that time, since that time, the, the, every five years, there is at the USDA, there is a microphone in the front of the room, and there's a whole committee that sits on the stage, and one after another person comes and declares their interest, whether they're the Salt Institute or the Chocolate Manufacturers or the Sugar Association or, or the Cattlemen's Beef Association or whatever. But the, the process, as ugly as it is, is in fact getting better. And in 2015, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee said there are three eating patterns that are healthy. Vegetarian, Mediterranean, which is kind of vegetarian light, and healthy U.S., whatever that means. But finally, 
the V word was part of federal policy. So here's where we are now. July 10th and 11th, the committee is back meeting. The microphone was there, and I want to tell you about 40 people, including Eric Adams, came and said, you've got to talk about plant-based meals if you talk about anything. There were more people advocating for plant-based meals than anybody, any, anything else. And there are two things that we would like to promote now. One is that meat and dairy products should be optional, not, a, not recommended. And secondly, we want to eliminate racial bias. And let me tell you what I'm talking about. First of all, on meat and dairy products being optional, the AMA came out very strongly on this as well. And so the, the, the dietary guidelines would say, you do not need, need meat, you don't need to have it at all. But the AMA also came up with another policy that might surprise you. They said that children shouldn't have to produce any documentation from alternative to cow's milk. Here's, here's what I mean. If, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you don't know what I'm talking about, lactose intolerance was once thought to be a disease that was rather rare. And in the mid-1960s, people discovered that it's the rule, it's the norm for everybody other than whites. And among whites, maybe 85% of people can tolerate lactose for most of their lives. But for other races, it's the norm. And to this day, there is a law that if you say, if I'm a 16-year-old African-American kid and I'm putting my tray down the school lunch line and they give me milk and I say, wait a minute, I've been lactose intolerant since I was seven. If I drink that, I am not going to be able to go to the debate club today. I'm going to be in the bathroom. By law, that child is not allowed to be served almond milk, soy milk, rice milk, or anything other than cow's milk. Now they can take it and pour it down the sink, but by the law they can't be given an alternative. The AMA said, stop that. That is racist. And not only that, but what happens if they exceed and drink the milk? Prostate cancer takes its greatest toll in African American men. I am not saying this was intentionally racist, but, I'm, but what I am saying is when you discover there's a problem, you gotta change it. So, I think it's time to wash our hands again. What I mean is, what I mean is, We've got to clean away some infections. And nutritional ignorance has infected our profession. And it's guarded, and it's time to clean it up and get rid of it. And I want to know if you're with me. Should we insist that nutrition be an integral part of medical education? Yeah. Should we call on our hospitals to serve healthy foods and take advantage of what we And finally, the biggest part of all, can we insist that federal food policies really prioritize health, not the financial and system? I think we're really convinced that we can clean away these things that affect our policies and affect our lives. We can really talk about maybe really just tackling these scourges of diabetes and heart disease and so forth that we now just see as intolerable problems. And I say, let's make our profession proud. Let's take the power that we have, let's share it with our patients, let's share it with our families, let them share it with their families, let them live. Life is tough, life is short, it's not perfect. Let's put this power to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see you right in the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to Dean, thanks to all the Thank you very much. Have a good night.